I don't know if you've ever felt like your life was on a trajectory that you really loved, things were going well, and you thought, I think we've kind of got this figured out, or let's be honest, probably none of us think that, but we like what's happening. And then all of a sudden, the unexpected slams into our life and leaves us wondering if God can do anything with the broken pieces that we hold in our hands. Well, in today's episode, we get to talk to Courtney Joseph Fallick, who's written a book, Still Standing, How to Live in God's Light While Wrestling with the Dark. And oh my goodness, how we need this book, Courtney. Uh, you know, girl, I've known of your ministry for many years and it's been extraordinary. You wrote the book, Women Living Well. You've got a ministry called Good Morning Girls. And yet, after the release of that book, yeah, life kind of took a left turn. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right. I began blogging in 2008. And at that time, I was a homeschool mom and I was married to my high school sweetheart. And so as I was blogging, I was sharing recipes and my marriage and my parenting and the the window of my life was just open. And I just, I would write devotionals. And I just wanted to encourage women. Um, I had gone to the Moody Bible Institute. I had a degree and, um, in the Bible of evangelism and discipleship. Discipleship. And so my heart out online was just to encourage women in their walk of life, whatever journey they were in. And so as I was doing that, um, I never expected that with my window wide open like that, that my world would come crashing down. And then I would have to tell people, not just in my private life, but also out online, uh, what was happening. And so um, it was in, after 19 years of marriage um, in 2015, uh, my husband left me for another woman and I did not see it coming. I know now looking back, I might be able to detect some red flags, but um, at the time I was deeply in love with him. I felt happily married. Um, he was a wonderful husband to me. There are always gifts on all the holidays and anniversaries and love notes and words of affirmation. And I thought we were working together as a team as far as being parents. And um, he was a deacon at our church for 10 years. Uh, we were leading Bible studies in our home together. And so I just, I did not see it coming. And so when it happened, the spiritual warfare began in my home and a battle like I've never fought uh, began. I can think of women on the other side of this interview who are going, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so wild to have your life one way, one moment, and then have it completely implode. Yeah. I discovered that this affair was happening. And so when I then said it out loud, to, it was when he just was like, yes. And so he left and, um, and then he came back and then he left and then he came back and we began to go on this kind of roller coaster ride up and down. And so during this time, I wanted reconciliation. That is all I wanted. I was like, we can fix this. I will forgive you. I recognize that the enemy is, you know, tempting you. And so we will fight for this. And at times I thought that was what was happening, that it, he was coming home and that we were working on this together and that God was doing a work. You know, I believe that this is what God, this is when he shows up best, right? He transforms lives. And so I was like, our story is going to be one of reconciliation. And never could I have dreamt that for for about two to three years, we would be in limbo until eventually I realized that he wasn't, he, we weren't going to make it, that he just kept continuing to be unfaithful and I needed to be healthy and set boundaries. And when I set those boundaries, that is when um, really um, him coming back again and again ended. And I began to move forward as a single mom. And at that time, he also moved away to another state, a uh, couple states away. And so uh, he wasn't around um, a lot. And so I became a single mom, uh, raising my two children. And my children no longer were homeschooled. They needed to go to regular school. And I continued my ministry out online. Wow. So everything changed. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, your status goes from single to married to divorced, and I didn't get to go back to single. It was now moving forward into now I'm in the category of divorced, and I never wanted that, never saw that coming. Yeah. And I think sometimes 
especially in the Christian realm, I mean, we really do believe in miracles and we, we want to work towards reconciliation. Um, you know, we actually kind of went through uh, some church issues and I fully believe that we have the grace to walk through those. And yet the Lord, the Lord said, no, I've got something different. And so, you know, that was kind of our choice, but I can't imagine how difficult it was to have the choice really taken out of your hands when he refused to change. And that's when I feel like the faith crisis begins because I'm like, but God, I prayed and I believed and, and I'm trying to follow you. Why are you not answering my prayers in the way that I want? And you realize that we don't have as much control in life as we think we do. And sometimes all our little formulas that we come up with, you know, I, I, and I wonder sometimes, and I, I'd be curious how you kind of came to understand it. You know, a lot of times people get angry at God because it's like, wait a minute, I did everything right. But how have you come to understand God's sovereignty and yet also the free will of man? I think it comes back to not blaming God for the things that we blame Satan for. You know, this is the enemy and the enemy was not my husband. The enemy is the devil and he comes to steal and kill and destroy. But yet Jesus came to give us the abundant life, John 10, 10. And so as we try to take hold of that abundant life, we can question, well, wait a minute, when everything is falling apart and, and everything is being stolen from me, how can I, we live in that tension of what the enemy is doing in our lives. He hates us. He hates our marriages. He hates our kids. He hates our churches. He doesn't want to see love and unity and all the things that God gives. And so we have to fight for it. We have to fight for the joy and fight for faith, trusting him that in the midst of what the enemy may be doing that God is good, that he is faithful, that he is the rock at the bottom when the bottom falls out, that he is there for us. And so in the midst of all these big unanswered prayers of the restoration of my marriage, God answered so many prayers where I was just crying on my bathroom floor. And I was like, God, just help me make it through today. And yeah. I did. God, just help me to enjoy life today, even though it's so unenjoyable, you know, and, and he did, and it, please protect me. And he did please provide for me. And he did. And so there's so many answered prayers. If we'll just look around and see that, but sometimes we can get so focused on that one thing that God didn't answer that prayer. Yes. He said no. And that, that hurts because I have an intimate relationship with God where I'm like, but God, don't you love me? But he showed me so many ways that he does love me, but it was in the smaller things. It wasn't in the big, the big prayer that I want to see answered. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I, I imagine like, I just try to put myself in your shoes. Like you said, not only were you experiencing the shattering of your marriage, but you had a public ministry and you were the girl who, who kind of had the answers or at least really pointed to the one who did. And how did, how did the enemy use that time against you? Right. Well, of a lot of, I would say shame and embarrassment was there. And I've never experienced that in my life because I've always been the good girl who tries to, you know, do everything right. You know, I've been going to church since I was a newborn. I grew up in a godly Christian home and I had wonderful parents and wonderful family. And so uh, I just wanted to recreate that in my own home. And so I was just going forward thinking that way. And suddenly I was like, this is so embarrassing. Everyone at church like knows like I'm that girl whose husband left her for, you know, like, what did she do wrong? Why would he leave her for someone else? Like, you know, and then just the, the embarrassment of that. And so, you know, I did, I hid a lot. I, I wanted to sit in the back row at church. I no longer was the girl who was willing to be up front. I, uh, didn't want to be in Sunday school and involved like I once was because I was leading things. And suddenly I was like, oh my goodness, all of this happening just so rocked my world. I didn't actually know how I was becoming a new person. God was taking me through this transition. And so in that season, it was it was hard. And, um, and I cried a lot of tears and I questioned, you know, God, but not in the way of like thinking that God was 
um, evil or bad or doubting that he was. It wasn't that, but it was just questioning him of just the whys of why are you not hearing my prayers? Why? What about my children? What about mm. my future? Just, I couldn't see the future. And so w- suddenly it was like, I'm 19 years old again. Like, what is my future? Who am I going to be when I grow up? Like, I mean, this was part of my identity. And so God was putting me firmly in, no, you are my child. I am with you and I will hold you and just trust me today. Trust me tomorrow, one day at a time, trust him. And then he took me through and I had to just take it one day at a time because there were no answers, you know, in immediate answers. It's been, you know, days, months, you know, years, you know, and eventually it'll be decades. And so now I can look back and I can see his hand and how faithful he was. But when I was in it, it was dark and it was hard and I had to fight for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you write so honestly about that and the different aspects of learning to live this new life that you did not choose. And, and even, you know, just some of the basic things like, you know, where's my money going to come from? And, you know, what, what am I going to do? How did, how did the Lord help you navigate all those new things and hard things? Well, in the most unexpected ways, because I would have thought that it was going to be just like, I really wanted God to swoop in with just like one or two people to just like fix it all. Right. And that's not how it was. It was always coming from different places. Sometimes it was my mom or dad. Sometimes it was a friend. Sometimes, you know, it was like the, you know, the person next door, but oftentimes it was strangers that God would use, or it would be YouTube. Like when the pilot light went out on my water heater and I'm like, like watching a YouTube to learn how to like get under there and relight it. And when I did those things, when God helped me, you know, figure things out, that is my confidence grew in God and in myself. That's like, I can do this. Okay. When I began to pay the bills for the first time in my life, he paid everything. Everything was in his name. I completely trusted my husband in that way. And so um, I just, cause I never thought this was coming. And so as I began to pay the bills month after month, I'm like, okay, I can do this. And, and so it just, it was one, like I said, one day at a time, one step at a time, but God did, he always came through. I mean, during COVID, that was a very hard time. We're all closed in our homes. I'm stuck with two teenagers and I'm like, oh, and I see people on Facebook, like we're having wonderful family time together. And I'm like, okay, no, I have two teenagers and I'm all alone and I'm the only adult. I need another adult. Right. But God showed up. I had a friend who my propane tank went out and, on my grill. And so I couldn't, and cook and I'd never changed it before. And I like sent out an SOS to like my Bible study group. And I'm like, I do not know what I'm doing. And she showed up at the door with her propane tank off of her grill and was like, here you go. My husband told me how to do this. I'm coming to your backyard and I'm putting it on your grill for you. And I'm like, thank you. And it was just those little kisses from God like that, where I was just like, he, God is helping me. And it, and it came from a lot of different places, but he's so faithful. And I'm, I, I just can't express a much so much like of how faithful he was. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I think we all want, we want to see the miraculous like that, but we don't often let ourselves get in that place of need. And so when you find that he really is, he really is faithful to his word. You know, I'm sitting here thinking of a dear friend, like mighty woman of God, so many parallels to your, to your story fought for her marriage, prayed for her marriage, believed for her marriage. Um, And yet it ended in divorce and it rocked her world because it kind of rocked her identity. She had really put her whole life and meaning in this role as wife and mother. And now she's alone. How, how was that for you? Yes. I loved being married. I I loved it. And so, right. It was that empty chair at the table, that empty spot in the garage, uh, going to the grocery store and all his favorite things. One of his favorite things for breakfast was grapefruit. And I used to cut all the little triangles and sprinkle the sugar on it and take it to his, he had an office in our house for him. And so suddenly just seeing grapefruit would bring grief. It would be triggering in the grocery store. I still think of him when I see grapefruit. And so it's like, it was so hard. There was that loss of that, like you said, like identity and just the loss of that person that I like to love on and take care of. And suddenly it was like, I don't do your laundry. There's just, you know, like just the change was, I I really felt that gap 
as and so as far as loneliness goes, um, I have to be honest. God was so present with me that I never struggled with the depths of loneliness in the sense that I never, I always felt his presence, but not in a tangible way. It wasn't like in an ooey gooey, like I feel God with me, but in the way that I felt like I, I knew I wasn't alone. I knew I wasn't alone. Like that confidence in that, I think the rhythms of life that I developed before he left me of being in God's word and of prayer and of meditation and memorization. Uh, one of my favorite things I like to do every morning, still even now as I light a candle in my kitchen every morning and I say a prayer of thanks and it's sort of a ritual, I guess you would say. Of a just And so these different rhythms in my life kept me, I feel, from falling all the way to the deepest depths. Because I every day was reminded in his word that he is with me, that he loves me. It's going to be okay. And I just had to keep trusting, keep believing, keep going. And, you know, and so that rhythm really helped a lot. And then God did, he did, I had to press into my girl friendships. Um, I will say that I sat alone a lot on Sunday mornings. I felt that alone, like being alone in church without my partner. And I had, during the divorce, I wanted to keep as much private and secretive, I guess you would say, as possible because I was hoping for reconciliation. So I didn't want to say anything to people that got back to him, that would upset him, and then it would get in the way. And so I didn't go to science school class. Instead, I would go and sit at a local coffee shop while my kids were in youth group. And then I would go into the worship service. And and so I disconnected from the people of God, which is like the thing you say not to do, right? Don't get isolated when you're being attacked by the enemy. But I disconnected and I went and I sat alone and I was, I just got into God's word and things. And I will say I felt a loneliness during that time. I did because I, because I chose to isolate myself and it was strategic, I guess you would say in my mind, <laughs> but actually it's not good and it's not God's way because he wants us in community. And so luckily it was only for a season and I do feel it was for the protection of myself. And so I don't regret it. And yet I could not have kept doing that long term. I think it would have been very unhealthy for me spiritually because the enemy likes to get you alone and that's where he's going to attack. It's like, you know, the the lion and the prey. He's going to take the one little straggler and that's where he's going to go after that one. And so we don't want to get alone. We have to show up for community, seek those girl friendships that do encourage us and, you know, be in church as best as we can and connect. And yet there's something so sweet, I think, about allowing the Lord to kind of isolate with him, you know, because yes. yes. sometimes if we're not careful, we just, we can take all of our needs that we had from our husband and put them on people. And so it's, it's kind of a both and thing, isn't it? You're right. How did you navigate the forgiveness piece? Well, one of the things I say in the book is that I forgave him not for him, but for me um, and the other woman. I, they're, they're still in our lives, right? And so I don't want to, I knew I didn't want to grow old, a bitter, like become a bitter woman. I don't want to be a woman who's always angry, always hurt, always a victim. Like, I'm like, no, I'm not going to give him that. I want to live free. And so that is why Jesus tells us to forgive. You know, it's so that we will be free of that. Give it to him. He can carry it. I can't carry it. It will hurt the rest of my life if I do. And so now it's like when we forgive, it's our wound becomes more of a scar. You know, a scar, you can still see, you can see where that injury happened. It happened. It, it did. But when you touch it, you don't flinch. It doesn't still hurt. And so if I hadn't forgiven, it would still continually be injuring me over and over. And so releasing that to God and letting him replace that with his love and just frees me. It frees him. And now I pray. I pray all the time for for his walk with the Lord and for, you know, and so that and for he's the father of my children. And so he right. still matters. And so we don't want to have them also living in the midst of that contention. Right. But I'm sure it's probably been like grief. There's waves uh, and waves of forgiveness that have to even perhaps continue to happen. Right. New things happen in the journey, in the story that's not necessarily told. And so you're like, oh, there that is again. Right. And so, yeah, that's why Jesus says 70 times seven. There's this continual forgiveness that because this 
divorce, one of the hard things about divorce is that it, it's chronic. It's not going to end in this lifetime. And it's it's got a ripple effect through generations. So it's affecting my children still now at Christmas time, you know, as they have to go to different homes and, and, you know, and eventually they'll have their children and they'll be, you know, going. And so we have this ripple effect that is hurtful and hard to navigate. And so it continues to require me to walk closely with the, the Lord, to have the wisdom and discernment, to know how to do this and as much as, as far as it depends on me to have peace with everyone, Romans yeah. 12 says. And so to walk through that is, it's, it's a journey. It's not a destination. You don't arrive and you're like, I've forgiven and it's all perfect now, right? You know, it's just, it's, we're still, we're still in it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Well, and you know, I, I, we talked about like, just, okay, you've got this public ministry, women living well, good morning girls. And yet now you have to come you're still called to that place. What, what, how did that change how you showed up or maybe even some of the fruit that you're seeing from it? Well, at the start, I thought that I, that this meant I couldn't do this anymore. I was like, I, I'm going to have to shut down. This is the end. I'm going to close it. And I talked with my family and extended family at one of our family dinners. And I said that out loud and they were like, no, don't do that. Like God wants to use you in this place. And I'm like, but I don't want to be used like this. Like, I don't want my ministry to be, <laughs> I don't want to talk about this, right? No, a million times. No, you know, I don't want this to be my story that I don't want this to be my ministry. And, but I will say that one of the greatest things I've learned through this first off being humbled. And then secondly, compassion, mm. because I have never experienced this depth of pain and loss grief, all the things I've had to walk through. I had to go looking for books on and podcasts on. I had to learn and boundaries. And I just, I've had so much learning to do about life. And, and so I feel like I've grown a lot in that. And so anything that I can use from my journey, um, I just want God to use that for others because I was there and, you know, and now I'm here and I still have more to learn. I'll never arrive, like I said, but, um, yeah, it really has changed, um, you know, who I am and how I've experienced God. I love that. I love that. I'm trying to remember what the verse is. I'm not sure. I think it was Jeremiah maybe. Um, and the translation that a friend shared with me was so powerful. And I, I, I kind of think it sums up what the Lord's doing in you. If you will extract the precious from the worthless, you will be my spokesperson. And I I think sometimes we, especially in our Christian culture, we think, I was just thinking this morning, we're like, you know, be thou an example of the believer, you know, in, in speech and in contact and faith. And we're like, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to get it together. I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to share how everyone else can do it right. But what, what if being a true example of the believer is to show how to grieve, how, how to mourn, how to forgive? How to let God get his hands on you when you just want to get your hands on somebody else and strangle <laughs> them, you know, that's, right. that's like where the rubber meets the road. And I think sometimes, sometimes in our perfection, you know, yes, God still uses us, but when it's down and it's hard and it's nitty and gritty, and yet the Lord's teaching us, you know, I just, I think of that verse that also talks about treasures of darkness in hidden places. And I know from personal experience, it's going through the valley, through those dark times. Don't we want to avoid the dark? And yet it has been in the dark that I feel like I've come out the other side to find out, oh my goodness, he's given me nuggets of gold in my pockets that I didn't even yes. know were going to be there. How, right. what, have you, what would you say are some of the biggest nuggets of gold that you picked up during that dark time? Well, I feel like that is what God did when I was going for those two years of that coffee shop. He was just like, come away with me. I'm going to love you and I'm going to, I'm with you and I'm present with you. And so for sure that, um, wow. I mean, I just feel that the, the, biggest part is that Satan won't have victory. The hope is in heaven that we know in the end that he wins. And so it's like some of these things in life, 
you wish in the moment you're like oh <laughs> like let's like it like god just like do it right now and it's like no he is such a gracious and loving father and so he he is with us and so just that hope of heaven of knowing that you know one day there'll be no more tears there'll be no more pain that life is but a vapor it is short this is not forever and there are seasons and thankfully these seasons do not last forever and so when i was in my season sometimes we can feel like it's never going to end and it did feel like that in the darkness. I couldn't see on the other side where the light was going to come, when I would be out on the other side. But God was so faithful in that darkness that now I'm not as afraid of the dark, right? Yeah. Because I know he's there. And like, it's like he is there in the dark and the light. I mean, Psalm 139 talks about that. Even the darkness is not dark to him. And so that is just like, and, and just the spiritual warfare side of things of just like, he has equipped us. He has given us a sword of spirit. He has given me the shield of faith. He's given me everything I need to stand and to stand strong. And so we can keep standing because he is with us. Amen. Amen. And you know, the enemy in my friend's life, she was a warrior. She was a warrior princess. She had the armor of God and yet everything fell apart. And so there has been this really beautiful deconstructing of her faith in the really healthy way that the stuff, those lies that I have to be perfect in order for God to use me, I everything has to be perfect, you know, she's finding such freedom in having some of those lies thrift away that, um, you know, it's just been beautiful to watch. It's been beautiful to watch her unfold. I totally relate to that. I, I relate to that because I remember going to one of my counseling sessions and, and my counselor saying to me, cause I always wore a skirt to church. Not that like my church doesn't people wear jeans there. It's fine. But I just always felt I had to, I, I know that sounds that might sound odd, but she was like, just try wearing pants this week. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and it felt so odd for me, but there were some of these things that I was doing that I don't, I didn't put it on other people for them to do, but for some reason on myself, I put unneeded pressure to be, like you said, to be as perfect as possible you know? And suddenly when it was like, oh, there is no way to do this perfectly. Like you are already upset, you know, like this is a mess. And so there was no way to hide this, that there is a freedom there that I didn't expect. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think about my dark night of the soul. And I told my husband, I said, I feel like I'm a car that's been stripped of all its parts and I'm up on blocks and I'm naked and I'm shivering and I'm cold. And there's all these perfectly good parts around me that I just want to put it back and be, be together. But there was something in my spirit, the Lord had been birthing. I said, but I want to be new more than I want to be comfortable. And I just think of that girl out there that her life has imploded. Everything that she worked so hard for has just flown to bits. And the enemy comes and says, you know, why even try? Just give up. Look at what God did to you. You call him good. How could he, how could he do that? You know, you, you write in, in the book about Romans 8, 28 and what it's come to mean to you. Well, I mean, it says all things work together for good, right? And yet we can know that the thing that we are facing is not good. Cancer is not good. The loss of a child is not good. And so this very, it can become almost how trite almost because we're like, oh, and people are just like, oh, this is going to all work together for good. And you're like, no, this is not good for my children. I know it's not good. And yet we can see that what the enemy meant for evil, God has meant for good because he is weaving a story for us that we cannot see in the moment. In the moment of the deepest pain, we need comfort. We don't always need people to tell us that this is going to all be worked out for good. We need comfort. We need to grieve. And I write a little bit about the grieving process in there because we can see how in the midst of grief, God has padded it. Like we use this denial at the beginning. I was a little, I was a bit in denial, fighting for my marriage, believing the best in him. And other people want to shake me and be like, Courtney, don't you see what he's doing? Just stop, you know? And, but God uses that to, because if we took the heavy weight of what is reality is happening to us, we may not be able to get out of bed, you know? And so that denial gets us to the next step, which is the anger phase, which gets us to the next stage step. And as we go through the phases of, you know, sadness and depression and stuff, and eventually we come out to acceptance. 
And it's in that stage of acceptance where everything as we've gone through grief, our whole world has been rocked and rearranged and everything is changing. And that is when we finally find peace because we're now accepting this new normal on the other side. And I feel that it's only then that Romans 8, 28 becomes a clear light for us that we can now see the good as we went through all of that. But when you're in the middle of those different stages of grief, and if someone says that to you, it can actually, it can hurt because we're like, no, this is not good. You don't understand how down in the depths I am right now. This is nothing that feels good in that moment. And so again, also, it's not a feeling. It's, 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 I guess you would say it's less subjective and more objective. It's like, we can look at it now and I can see God is so good. He is yeah. so good. Yeah. But only in the acceptance phase can I really yep. see it. I think it's Elizabeth Elliot that writes, in the pathway of acceptance lieth peace. And, you know, she lost her husband to, to being killed by the very tribes they went to minister to. And I think, I think it is a process. And I'd love that you bring out, you know, those trite things that we say to each other that are true, but they, yeah, they, they don't necessarily help. I, I don't know about you, but I came out, came out of my dark night of the soul thinking, yeah, I, I don't know that I'm going to be so quick to come up with some kind of a comforting thing. Just what were the things that your friends did for you during that time that really helped? I would say they showed up physically. So, and it wasn't like to do work at my house or something like that, but with my favorite coffee, with flowers, uh, prayer, just telling me that they're praying for me. I know a lot of them are very busy too. I mean, I was in a busy season raising my kids and most of my friends were in that same season, right? They're going to all their soccer games and, you know, like running their kids to all their things. And so just the ones that took the time to send a text that said, I'm thinking of you today and I'm praying for you. You're not forgotten. Just that yeah. I was on their mind and heart. And oftentimes, oh my goodness, please do this. If the Lord brings someone to mind, send them a text and tell them, because oftentimes I would be like, thank you, because you don't know what I was just facing like an hour ago. And God brought that to mind. And that meant so much. And so as simple as just a text saying that I'm thinking of you and praying means so much, but also just surprise showing up at the door. I mean, <laughs> it meant a lot or with our favorite ice cream or just those small things like that being invited with couples. Um, because then once I was a single, it was like, I was like a third wheel, a fifth wheel, a seventh, you know, like I didn't have that partner. And so I would feel bad. I remember going to a 40th birthday party for a friend and, and the way the tables were, there were four at each table. And so I'm like, Oh shoot, I felt bad for my friend and her husband because now they're stuck with me and I don't have a guy for her husband to talk to, but they were they they didn't mind. They loved me in that way, just ex including me even though I didn't have a partner meant a lot and I know that was a sacrifice sometimes for them. You know, but that that meant a lot that my friends still I had I continued to have a lot of married friends and they still included me and that meant a lot. That's beautiful. That's really, that's an important piece of advice. I love that. Well, the title is still standing. What would you say to those girls whose life has been rocked and they, they, they're like, they feel themselves falling or maybe just flat on the ground right now. How do we get to that place where we can still be standing? I would say to read Psalm 46, I have it right here in front of me, read Psalm 46 every day, 30 days straight, 60 days straight, as many days as you need to and commit it to memory. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. So when your world is shaking, as the mountains are shaking and trembling and all these things, and it feels like it, trust in God. He is present. He is with you. And that Psalm ends. It says, be still and know that I am God. Know that he is God. Keep trusting in him. Be still. Give him time to work. He is working in your life and he is faithful. Mm, so beautiful. So, so beautiful. Would you pray for us as we close? 
Yes, I will. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray for all the women that are listening right now who are going through really hard, dark things. Lord, you know exactly what it is they are going through and what they need right now, Lord. I pray first that you would give them a light of your truth to shine into their darkness. I pray that you would speak to them in very unique ways through your word and through friends and loved ones who reach out to them. I pray that you would move in the hearts of those around them to help them, care for them, and love them. And Father, I pray for those who aren't going through this right now, but who have a friend that is, I pray that you would use them in their friend's life to bring that light of truth to them and to love them and care for them. God, you love us and you use us as your hands and feet. And so I just pray that your love would pour down on us and then through us onto others, Lord. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.